Welcome back to another episode of the Media Pass. I'm your host, Alex, joined as always by my other host, Matt. Matt, how are you doing now that the NBA playoffs are in full swing? I feel better, dude. I've, I don't know about you, but like, well, first of all, I don't know if you, how you felt on Friday, but Friday morning, I'd finished all my playoff prep and I had nothing to do like for the first time in forever. I was just sitting there. I'm like, there's nothing for me to do right now. Um, so there was that, but then like, you, it's like nerve wracking. Cause I feel like it's so overwhelming, like that eight game two day. And you're like the, the thing about these eight games, cause I know we have the same thing next weekend. But the thing about these eight games is you're seeing all these teams match up for the first time. So you're trying to get like acclimated to like the terms of engagement and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's overwhelming. It's fun. Um, it's a little infuriating sometimes. We'll talk about some of the takes I think that have been matriculating that I don't necessarily agree, agree with, but it's just a bunch of feelings. What about you? Uh, I had the complete opposite problem on Friday. I was mm -hmm. unbelievably busy on Friday, uh, not because of like necessarily like playoff prep or anything. I just had videos that I had to get out for um, business reasons. But uh, yeah, we're here. Uh, a wise man once said uh, not too, too long ago, uh, y'all going to get this podcast and uh, we're here and y'all are going to get this podcast. Uh, allergies are still hitting me like a freight train. Um, so that's fun, but, uh, we'll survive, uh, before we jump into the playoffs and, uh, really get into the meat of things, I believe we have a couple of questions, not a ton of questions from last episode. Uh, so this should be relatively smooth sailing to get through these. Uh, but let's kick it off with our first question from. Steamy Ramen seven seven four three frequent commenter uh, and funny username. Uh, quite possibly the greatest pod to have ever been potted. Thank you, fellas. If you were to one v one three dribbles only, who's taking the win here? So I'm guessing they're asking between you and me. Yeah, they're trying to pit us against each other. I know that's awful. I can't believe they would do uh that to us. Well, we, me and Alex have actually never played together pickup basketball. I don't like, so we don't know each other's game. My game is definitely not suited for one on one. I'm very um, off ball y. Um, anytime I drive, it's almost always off of the catch, never really self generated. Um, I'm like a, and then on defense, like my, my probably weakest skill is isolation defense. So I don't know. I, I feel like one on one is just not, not for me, man. What, what about you? So I, I got bad news for you. Uh, you, are you a great one-on-one -on -one player? I'm not great by any means, oh. um, but I have I have been. Other people have told me that uh, I have like a Brandon Ingram type game in okay. pickup, uh, and I, I whenever I play like three dribbles one v one, I definitely can see that comp a little bit. I'm also not the flex or anything. I'm also six foot I'm three and some change. So I got, mm -hmm. I got the height advantage too. So a lot of things working in my favor is all I'll say, but, uh, Matt is significantly stronger than me. So I think that levels the playing field a good amount. It would be, you know, what would it be? It would be like when it's Brandon Ingram versus Lou Dort. That's pretty much, I think would be the Ooh. best way to summarize our games. It's pretty much exactly we're, it. And we're going to be talking about, uh, Brandon Ingram versus Lou Dort, uh, today. Cause that yeah. was, uh, something we saw last night. Um, so that actually was a good little piece of foreshadowing. Uh, good we'll question. We'll have to play Thank in Summer you. League this year. Um, we definitely we'll will. Do, we'll have to do That'll that. be a fun little piece of content. Yeah. Um, uh, we got the next comment from Trey Lee, three frequent commenter. Thank you. Uh, shout out both of you for still delivering while sick. I don't know if I would consider allergies sick, but you're welcome. I don't uh, know if I'd consider what we do delivering. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but happy to do it nonetheless. Uh, what I want to ask you guys is, who do you think has the prettiest jumper in the NBA right now? My personal fave is Shea Gilgis Alexander's, especially his fadeaway. Do you have a, a particular player in mind for this question? I feel like it's it's still got to be Clay, doesn't it? Like even though it like doesn't really go in anymore. I'm a little biased, but I think Chris Middleton has an absolutely like beautiful jumper. Mm -hmm. He was um, awesome yesterday. I'll give yeah he was I'll give a nod to him. 
Next comment is from Ian Kernut 3350. Thank you for answering my question again. Love the content as always. Happy to do it. Uh, which player, past or present, had the worst free throw attempt you've ever seen? I've got to give it to Chuck Hayes against the Nuggets. I don't uh, have a, a particular shout in mind for this one. Do you? How many free throws have you watched this season? I've probably watched I, like five. I usually look at my phone during yeah. free throws or like check Twitter. Or skip over or skip over it when um it's like a we're not a non live game. So I don't I don't even I almost never pay attention to free throws. Yeah, and I'm usually like when I'm watching games, I'm clipping stuff live. So like during free throws, I'll just fast forward through them to get to the whatever I missed because I was clipping something. So uh I don't have a good answer. Uh interesting question though, for sure. Uh those are all the questions. What's up, guys? I'm editing the podcast right now. Just wanted to let you know that we recorded this episode before last night's games. Today is 4-23-2024. Uh, it's Tuesday. Monday's games were last night. We recorded this episode on Monday morning. So everything that we say in this episode was kind of in reference to game one of all of the series uh, that happened. So keep that in mind as you're listening. Uh, a lot of stuff will still ring true. Some stuff may not. Uh, but just keep that in mind. Wanted to give you guys context. Uh, just popping in to let you all know that we have another episode coming out Friday. Sorry if this is a little bit confusing, but, uh, yeah, we'll see you Friday. Hope you enjoy this episode. The first game that was on the docket was Cavs magic. Now I admittedly did not watch this. Uh, I was busy, uh, during the day that day. Do you have some thoughts on this? Um, just that I think Donovan Mitchell looks good. Um, I think he looks really good, which is promising for Cleveland. I think that this is a good Georges Niang series. So, like, if they have to go – because I think I've tweeted about this. I don't know if I've talked about this a lot on the pod, but I, I think Dean Wade really raises the ceiling of this team and, like, the the kind of um, lineup versatility he opens up is huge. But I think for this particular series, I think Georges Niang can do all the things that you would have needed from Dean Wade and maybe a little bit better just because he's a little bit burlier, a little more physical – I think Cleveland did a good job of rising to the occasion in terms of physicality. I think Mobley was solid. I think Allen was solid. He was beasting people. Um, and I think Orlando's offense is just just a lot, a lot, um, a lot worse than I think most people might have expected it to be in the postseason. It was pretty bad. And I think my last takeaway would be I mean, I kind of hinted at this a couple pods ago, but I, I really think that People got a little too excited about Jonathan Isaac's uh, postseason impact. He wasn't. He really didn't move the needle for me. I think he played like 25, 26 minutes in that game. Um, he started at center, which was cool to see Jamal Mosley try that. But then it led to some like wonky lineups in the second quarter where they were playing Wendell Carter and Mo Wagner at the same time. And that was just wasn't pretty. Uh, yeah, that's kind of my overall takeaway. This is it's going to be you tweeted this. This is going to be a, a trench warfare type series. Which, if you if you like that kind of basketball, by all means, uh, this is the series for you. Um, just quick glance at the box score, like the shooting in this game across the board was awful. Uh, mm. No, no other way around it. I, Cleveland shot thirty two percent overall from the field, twenty twenty two percent from three, or that was the magic rather. Uh, Cleveland shot forty four percent, twenty seven percent roughly from three uh yeah i mean if you like loud misses off the off the basket then you this is the series for you um the, the i will say cleveland go ahead go, go ahead. ahead no i'll go ahead, you um, go ahead you go cleveland <laughs> cleveland started that game five for five from three which so that's that makes their ultimate percentage even funnier because i think yeah, after that both teams were kind of like in the low 20s from three now, here's an interesting question, because this is obviously such a defensively slanted series, um, and we don't have to spend too much time talking about this. Um, how much do you view Darius Garland as kind of like a big swing factor for this series? Because we've seen him in the past offensively, Darius Garland can kind of ascend to some pretty ridiculous levels uh, as far as being like kind of a Steve Nash type scorer where... You know, he's carving defenses and breaking guys down off the dribble and getting inside. 
um, and creating advantages. Uh, and then the perimeter shooting, obviously, he's statistically, he was one of the best pull up three point shooters in the entire league. Uh, not this most recent season, but uh, last season. Um, and we kind of haven't seen him reach that level again. But I feel like if they end up getting some variation of that Darius Garland in this series, that would just be enough to kind of push them over the edge um, in a series as defensively slanted as this one. Yeah, I mean, he had a couple nice moments. Um, there was this one pass he made. I can't remember what quarter it was, maybe the third, where he, he made a really nice manipulation move and it led to a layup pass. Um, I don't think he was... The thing about the Orlando Magic that's a little bit problematic is they can't really hunt Cleveland's guards that well because they start Jalen Suggs and Gary Harris, and neither one of them like play that type of game where they can just put them in pick and roll and attack them that way. And then when Paolo tries to do it, it just leads to these kind of long, groggy possessions where it's like it takes like 10 to 12 seconds to actually get the matchup you want, and then by that time it's just like the defense is loaded up. But – um. I mean, if Garland's clicking and Mitchell continues to play the way I saw him play in game one, this is going to be a really quick series. It's going to be a lot quicker than we think, just because then Cleveland's offensive rating will be a lot higher, maybe like the one high 110s or low 120s. And then Orlando just – I what like one thing I feel like almost certainly confident about is Orlando just – they their offense is not. They're going to need to win this with turnovers, fast break, and just like super physical post ups, like their offense is just not on the caliber of any other playoff offenses. To be honest, yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, we've talked about that during the regular season. Um, unless you have anything else to add, I think we can probably put a button in that mm. uh, and move on to probably one of the most uh, nice. hyped games of the playoffs so far, just in terms of the moments that we got to see. Uh, the Phoenix Suns versus the Minnesota Timberwolves. This game, obviously, for me as a diet Minnesota Timberwolves fan was a lot of fun, but the basketball fan in me uh, really enjoyed this game just from like a tactical perspective, top to bottom, because early on, the Suns were fighting. And I say fighting like they were kind of having like as if they were scratching and clawing, trying to stay in the game. But in reality, it looked like, oh yeah, Kevin Durant's going to get the Rudy Gobert matchup and he's going to get whatever he wants every time. Um, And to a certain extent, I think the Timberwolves kind of just realize Kevin Durant, you can't really guard him. Put Jaden McDaniels on Kevin Durant. It doesn't really matter that much because it's Kevin Durant. Um, And so they're like, let's stick Rudy Gobert on him. And, you know, make Kevin Durant have to deal with that length and even though Rudy Gobert isn't maybe the necessarily the most mobile defender in the world um even though I do think there are some mis uh misconceptions about his ability to defend in space uh it feels like the Timberwolves were just kind of like yeah we'll we'll make him have to deal with this and and put our personnel elsewhere and uh you know Kevin Durant scored a lot but ultimately the approach worked. The Timberwolves won by 25 points. Uh, And I don't know. I think coming into this series, there was a lot of hullabaloo about how bad of a matchup this was for the Timberwolves uh, because the Suns swept the series in the regular season. And now how much of the, and I don't necessarily know how much pre series concern you had for the Timberwolves, but what is your pulse like with the Timberwolves now? Are you viewing this as maybe a, a quick series, a, yeah, I could go to six or seven, or do you still think that the Suns are, they just haven't shown their hand yet or they haven't gotten the best version of themselves yet? I think that this is still going to be a long series. I still like the Suns. Um, before why I say that, before why I think that, I want to point out a couple things you said that I agree with. One thing that really dawned on me when I watched the season finale is like the Timberwolves are a weird matchup. The Suns are a weird matchup for the Timberwolves because the Timberwolves, obviously they have the best defense in the NBA, but like, you know how we're in the era of duos now, right? Like most teams have like a great duo and then a bunch of great role players. 
the Suns are like that weird team that still has like a big three. And the Timberwolves are set up to guard like almost every other team in the league really well because they have their duo of defenders, duo of on-ball perimeter defenders in Anthony Edwards, Jaden McDaniels. And then they have like these good team defenders around them. And so when they matched up, it was like um, in, in that season finale, it was Edwards on Durant, McDaniels on Booker. And then like, who do you put? I mean, yeah. And then who do you put on Beal? And you can't do Cat. Cat's too slow. So they had to put him on Allen, which puts him in a bunch of weird situations because he's not a great chaser defender. And then Gobert obviously is going to go on Nurkic. So you have to put Mike Conley on Beal. And Beal just, you know, he just ate that matchup up. Um, it was it was pretty easy for him. And I, I actually pinpointed him as kind of the X factor because I'm like, how do they how do they deal with this? So I really, really like the Timberwolves decision to just be like, you know what, we, we're probably not going to be able to stop Durant anyways. So why don't we just put Cat on him and actually try to neutralize Booker and Beal? Um, Because we've seen before, like, solo Durant at 50-point games is not going to win you a playoff series. You know, it's not enough. Right. So I like that decision a lot. Um, I thought Gobert looked really well. I think Cat looked great. This is the best game I've seen him play since he came back. He looked phenomenal on offense. Um, that was huge. Uh, I think Kyle Anderson's injury, a little bit of a blessing in disguise, forcing them to go seven, just letting Gnaw and, um, and Reed. Both of them had phenomenal games. I think that was awesome. But I'll say this. I'll say this. Um, that game was close, like, through for two and a half quarters, right? They were battling. Both teams looked like they were an even match for each other. And then Ant erupted. And I thought it was like, you know, I, I, I appreciate his game. I think he's he's got the kind of game that will, you know, do well in the playoffs generally. I think he's going to have a great career. I think he's going to be an all-NBA caliber player. I think we'll we'll have a lot of conversations about him over the years about his splendor. But I I think what happened on Saturday is a little bit overblown. Why do I say this? If you look back at his run, it's all contested pull-up jumpers. And like, you know, like when Jason Tatum does that, fine. That's it. Jason Tatum's a great pull-up jump shooter. When Brandon Ingram does it, when Kevin Durant does it, you're like, okay, that's that's him cooking. Anthony Edwards has not had a good season as a pull-up jumper pull-up jump shooter. I think he's in like the 31st percentile in mid-range field goal percentage. Almost all of those are obviously pull-ups. And then he's like in the 50th percentile in pull-up three. So it's not like, it's not anything crazy. So he kind of got hot. And you tweeted this out about him, his passing being, leaving a little bit on the table. What the Suns are trying to do in the series, I think they went away from it a little bit in the third quarter. And I think they made the mistake of doing that. It led to some open Nas Reed threes and open uh, Nikhil Alexander Walker three. But the mistake they made was going away from what they were doing in the season finale, which is we're going to switch a lot and then we're going to pack the paint. We're going to dare Jaden McDaniels to beat us. We're going to dare Nikhil Alexander to beat us from three. But most importantly, we're going to dare Ant to have the discipline to not just drive into the paint or settle for mid-range jumpers. We're going to dare him to make the right read. And he did not make a lot of good passes in this game. I, I was not impressed with his passing. And I think he he took the dare and he he beat him today. But I don't know if that's going to happen every game of the series. And that's why I still kind of like the Suns. Now I will say the Suns had some have some concerns. Their bench, extremely concerning. Grayson Allen injury, pretty concerning. I don't even because I didn't watch the last seven minutes of the game because it was a blowout. Did he even come back in the game at any point? Uh I I had the game on, but I when, mm-hmm. once they put the bench lineups in, I was kind of out. Yeah. So Luca Garza saw the floor and I was like, okay. Um, Do you agree I, with that, I w- though? Yeah, I, definitely. I mean, when Thaddeus Young was out there, I was like, ooh. Um, you know, Thaddeus Young is uh, historically has been a, a productive player. He's had a productive career, but this version of him is um, definitely not. I thought Royce O'Neal uh, was like a major, major swing factor for them. Um, he shot five of 10 from the field, four of eight from three. Um, a lot of those uh, were just catch and shoot threes. Um, and he knocked them down. Uh, Eric Gordon, I'm concerned about because Eric Gordon, I thought did not look good. I mean, he, he mm-hmm. didn't make a single shot the entire night. Um, but even aside from that, he seemed just kind of out of the flow um, he was definitely like the odd man out when he was on the floor with um, one of KD, Booker, or Beal. Um, 
and just like obviously with those guys you want them to be running the offense and Eric Gordon just kind of in a spot up role maybe like a second side uh, pseudo creator um, that kind of deal but it felt a lot to me like at times it would turn into the Eric Gordon show and I think I've tweeted this before but like I've made the joke Eric Gordon will get the best screen you've ever seen and do absolutely nothing with it. Um, and I, I think we saw that in this game. It's mm-hmm. like you get, you'll get an opportunity where Nurkic was creating uh, a chance for him to create a very clear advantage uh, coming off of a screen or even get like a good look coming off the screen. And the Timberwolves had a pretty easy time defending him just because like, yeah, he'd get the screen. He dribbled to the other side of it. And then just keep dribbling at the top of the key without like a drive. He wouldn't shoot. He wouldn't make a pass. Nothing. Um, And to me, that's a problem, especially with Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, and Bradley Beal. Like, even if they're not running your offense, if you're having Eric Gordon run your offense, then you need Eric Gordon to be facilitating and moving the ball and greasing the wheels. And that's not what Eric Gordon's doing. Um, And I came away with with the fact that he's probably the one guy I'm most concerned about um, for the Suns in this series, just because I don't think he's doing enough to grease the wheels for a team that desperately needs some WD forty in their spokes. Like it's it's bad. That's a good reference. That's a good reference, man. You're definitely the kind of guy who changes his own oil. Um, <laughs> Not yet. I need you? to learn. Okay. I need to watch some YouTube videos. That's a good skill to say you have. I don't have it in my bag, but I want to. It's like when you keep like tools in your car, just so people think you got like you got something you do. Right. But it's just you know you just have them there to look cool. But I was going to ask you, is because another player on their bench that deeply concerned me, Drew Eubanks, looked pretty bad yep. for most of the game. Do you think they should even go with like a traditional backup center, or should they just go small ball since the the Timberwolves kind of do that anyways? So theoretically, would that be going just shortening the rotation and going what seven deep, or no, do you have someone else tenable. on their bench that you would you think would you would bring off um, to kind of fill that void of the Drew Eubanks? I mean, what what's your mileage mileage um at this point on Bull Bull? I think the value of just kind of length alone is potentially something to explore um i think you'd have to be very selective about when he's used um and how he's used and kind of what positions you force him to be put into because like i think there's avenues where that's very exploitable for the timberwolves and then there's also avenues where that's very disruptive for the timberwolves because we've seen like the suns are going to provide super super heavy gap help they're going to be trapping anthony edwards um, and forcing the ball out of his hands and forcing him to make decisions. Um, in Bowl Bowl, I think just the virtue of length alone will help. And for as kind of awkward as he may look moving, um, as guys do at that height, uh, he's he's generally pretty mobile enough to get by. Um, and we've seen him operate as kind of that weak side rim protector at times and be able to make those rotations and um, – obviously with length like that closing out you always have like a five percent chance that oh you might get a finger on it block a shot on on a corner three and that's something that the Timberwolves were feasting on was corner threes like Nikhil Alexander Walker we you were talking about it like he shot what what do you shoot from three four of nine from three probably all four of those were corner threes no he had one nasty pull up that's right that's right uh Nas Reed two of six for three kind of an off shoot not kind of it Mm. was an off shooting night for him but I think the two threes that he made were corner threes um and I think just having length to make shooters alter those shots a little bit and like maybe you know all of a sudden they're worried it might get blocked or or the contest comes a little bit quicker than they thought got to put the shot up a little bit higher they get thrown out of rhythm you know, stuff like that, I think helps, but Drew Eubanks is definitely not going to be doing that. Um, so I, I would agree with you. I think Bobo's definitely worth just like, let's throw him out there, 
see what kind of impact you get out of him. And, you know, I think to a certain extent, it can't be much worse than what they got from Drew Eubanks. He only played okay, nine so, minutes. He he was minus 14 in the nine minutes. Yeah, yeah it was bad. It was bad. Um, so I think we can we can both agree Timberwolves clear edge bench-wise, even though they really have only two guys that they can trust on that bench, it's still just better than any guy the Suns have on the bench. Um, where So where do you stand on this series at this point? Has it changed? I know you had Timberwolves coming in, so... I still, I still think I lean the Timberwolves. One thing I'm mm-hmm. monitoring is I, th- I believe there's a world where as this series progresses, I think there is a chance that with Anthony Edwards probably receiving similar slash the same defensive looks throughout the series, I think there is a possibility that he'll adapt over the course of this series where we mm-hmm. see steady improvement against these traps and against these double teams and blitzes um, where he's maybe occasionally making passes over the top to find, you know, the man on the short roll, or he's quicker to come with those, uh, you know, just simple one pass away out of the double. Um, Cause really that was the biggest problem was he was eventually getting to the passes sometimes. Um, but it was just like one second too late to mm-hmm. where the defense has fully recovered and they left a lot of open threes on the table. But I think over the course of this series, if the Suns continue to throw the same defensive looks at him like that, uh, I'm optimistic that he'll adapt and eventually make those passes quick enough to where like the Timberwolves are just feasting on open threes if they keep doing that. Um, That's just something I'm watching. I I still think the Timberwolves probably win this. I think it's probably going to be a long series. I think it'll be a good series. But um, I just think... The bench talent's a big factor. The overall defensive ceiling of the Timberwolves is a big factor. Um, And the Suns, I mean, the Suns' offense is still very concerning. It Mm. just No, I I I agree. I agree. The ball movement was not um, up to par like the way it was in the season finale. I think, yeah, at the end of the day, I think think the biggest factor, I think, in the rest of the series that I'll be watching for is just Anthony Edwards' decision-making. I think that'll be kind of the thing that, Decides the rest of this. Absolutely. So moving on to the Eastern Conference, uh, we had the New York Knicks versus the Philadelphia 76ers. Uh, the cover story for this game, obviously, is Joel Embiid. Um, I believe it was the second or third quarter where he went down with mm. what looked like I, when it happened, I was like, that's a major injury. That's not good. Like non contact, uh, went up for the dunk comes back down immediately fall like crumples to the ground. Um, and my first thought was, Oh, he just tore an ACL. He just blew out his patellar tendon, something like that. Like I was immediately convinced it was very bad. Um, but ultimately he goes to the locker room, comes back out. Uh, and you know, the Sixers, I still think had a very valiant effort, uh, considering they were without Joel Embiid for a long portion of that game. Um, longer than you want to be without him in a playoff game. Uh, and the Knicks ultimately come out on top, 111-104. The thing about this game to me is Jalen Brunson did not even play very well by his usual standards. Mm-hmm. And I understand there's the Joel Embiid factor, um, which is definitely a big thing. Um him getting hurt and them being without him longer than they would like to. Uh, Jalen Brunson not playing well and the Knicks still winning was kind of like, ooh, Philly's in for a long series. I thought Mitchell Robinson was fantastic on MB. Oh, yeah. Like some of the best defense I've ever seen Mm -hmm. played against Mm -hmm. Joel Embiid. uh, Full stop. It was great. Did not foul hardly at all. Um, super disciplined, was guarding him out in space really, really well. The rebounding was spectacular. That was kind of the thing to me that was like, ooh, this is a card that the Knicks have in their pocket that probably works a little bit better than I would have thought it would if you asked me about it before the series. 
Yeah, he just he was looking so stiff. I watched the Celtics game where Brunson dropped 40 right before the end of the season. And I was just like, man, Mitch, look, he just looks like he's trying to get back into shape. But he was – this Knicks team, it's funny to think because, like, you know, the whole joke is, like, Tibbs is going to play all his guys, like, 80 minutes every night. But they're, like, deep. It's like – like play, they're playoff deep. I, like, three of their four best players – and three of their – yeah, honestly, three of their four best players in this game came off the bench. Boyan Bogdanovich, his shot making in the second quarter, his mismatch hunting. Um, I actually think he's better at mismatch hunting Maxi than Brunson is, just because Maxi's length can't bother him as much. Um, Miles McBride, just a phenomenal yeah, I- game, phenomenal game off the bench, um, both sides of the ball. And then, of course, yeah, Mitchell Robinson was the star of the show in this game. It's crazy. People, we don't talk enough about how the Knicks have two top twenty centers on their team, and how no. even though, go ahead. I want to stop you real quick Mm because you said Mitchell Robinson's probably the star of this game. There's one guy we haven't even mentioned yet. Oh, no. I said three of the four stars of the game. You're talking about Josh Hart? Josh Hart. Oh, dude, he is ready. I was so, like, so back it up real quickly. Coming into this postseason, I was just like, (laughs) coming into this postseason, my biggest question mark about the Knicks was Josh Hart because, I mean, last season, if you watch that Heat series, for all of, like, Tibbs loves this guy. He loves him to death. Like I think if Tibbs could could handcraft his son, he could do. Um, you ever seen um Gattaca? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. You remember how you could like you know manipulate your child's like genetic code to make yeah. them like perfect. Like if Tibbs had the option of doing that, he would have just created Josh Hart. That's how much he he loves that dude. But he's a undersized guy. He's that player we've talked so much about. He's a wing slash forward who can't shoot threes. And he's not an on-ball player. And, like, those players tend to not do well in the postseason unless they're huge, like Aaron Gordon and can cut and dunk and do all that stuff. So I was coming to this postseason, like, he is so integral to everything they do. And there's, like, a realistic shot he gets played off the floor. Dude, he did not give one shit about anybody. Did you – do you remember that one play? Um, it was, like, a sequence late in the third quarter. Hart, you know, he loves to push the pace. He pushes the pace – and Bede's there in the paint, and he kind of is, like, deterred by him, kicks it out, kills the drive. A couple possessions later, Hart realizes he messed up. He gets the ball, pushes the pace, and he's like, I just, I'm just i just going to drive right into him, Bede. I don't care. Drove right into him, finished through the contact, and had the free throw. Like, just didn't yeah, back down at about. all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, did not back down at all, dude. He was phenomenal, phenomenal in this game. And I don't know. I don't even know what else to say about it. It was incredible. The one thing I will say about Josh Hart that I'm mm. going to be watching throughout the rest of the series is I think throughout the entire first quarter, he didn't – so he shot four of eight from three on mm-hmm. the game. Mm-hmm. In the first half, Josh Hart was one of three from three. So 33%. You know, mm. A lot of guys after a, a half will see that. They'll be like, I'm not, probably not going to be shooting a ton of threes anymore. Josh Hart in the second half after going one of three from three – Went three of five in the second half, 60%. And then on the whole, on on the game as a whole, he shot uh, four of eight. Um, If Josh Hart is a fearless three point shooter like that, and it isn't just the fact that he was willingly taking the shots throughout the entire course of the game. It isn't just the fact that he shot 50% from three of the course of the entire game. It's the fact that he was missing throughout the first half and even through the third quarter and then all of a sudden the fourth quarter rolls around and he's still willingly taking those shots and not not scared to do it at all that's the stuff we talked about this in the regular season we were like who are the players that are going to swing a series for a team who are the role Mm -hmm. players that really shift the balance and tip the scales in favor of one team or the other and to me josh hart coupled with the defense and the rebounding and the ability to get out and run in transition and be aggressive. If he, he's not going to shoot 50% from three over the course of the series, probably. (laughs) But if he's still a fearless three point shooter, like he, like he was and can even get some level of this to me, that tips the scales. Yeah. It's just like the, the ability to, not bog down the offense with like with uh timidness you know there was that one shot because the, the Knicks did a really good job I mean excuse me the 76ers did a pretty good job of kind of 
um, disorienting the Knicks with that zone in the fourth quarter. And it was really Hart who broke him out of it. It's like, it was like five seconds left on the shot clock at one point, gets the ball. I think so, like he kind of got a ball screen. His defender went under. He's like, you know, I'm just going to pull it. And he pulled it and it was bang, you know, it was money. Um, yeah, I agree. I think he's got to keep being fearless because they need his like crashing the offensive glass. They need his physicality on the defensive board. They need all that. They need his ability to play. I made a note. He only played 41 minutes in this game. That's the note I made. He only played 41 minutes in this game. Um, that's just, that's who he is. He's built like that. One, one thing I should note though, is that Philly was minus 21 in Paul Reed's 11 minutes. So that means that they were still, they're still like a fairly good team when Embiid's on the floor. Um, so it's, I think that's going to be one of the big data points to keep paying attention to is how much can the Knicks exploit the Paul Reed minutes and how much will Embiid's body allow him to make sure there's not Paul Reed minutes. Yeah, I, I fully agree. Um, real quick, just kind of, we've mm. talked a lot about the Knicks, some quick notes for the Sixers. Uh, Kyle Lowry shot fantastic. Um, I thought he played a really good game overall. Um, even defensively, I thought he was really, really good doing just the Kyle Lowry things that we know he does. Um, Nick Batum, one of four from three. That's after that heater that we saw him have. Mm. Um, the other night, uh, Buddy Heald only played 11 minutes. Um, o of two from the field, O of one from three, minus 16 in 11 minutes. Um, considering how much like the Buddy Heald trade was kind of viewed as this big, uh, significant swing factor for the 76ers, that performance is concerning, but also it's hard for me to believe that Buddy Heald just shoots zero percent from the field over an entire series like i think there's an element of yeah the knicks played terrific defense i Mm -hmm. thought um but the sixers missed a lot of open looks a lot yeah the knicks knicks won the variance battle this is still as long as i beat kicking this is there's still a lot to unpack with this series like this is not the last we've seen of it um, for example, like the, the Knicks had no answer for Tyrese Maxey. As much no. flack as I've given him all season, they had nothing for him. They tried OG Inobi, which I think is something they've got to stop. I think he's more valuable as an off-ball player in this series on defense, but he was just too fast for Inobi. Hart had some success, success but he was kind of in foul trouble. They didn't want to risk it. Deuce, like, you know, he plays hard, but at the end of the day, like Maxey's just a little bit taller. I can get a shot up over him. Um they kept late switching a lot, and any time they did that, Maxi would just burn them. And I think it's – you know what's uh, – this is kind of a pivot point, but I think this is like an overarching theme from this weekend because we saw it with this Timberwolves series. We saw it with their win. We saw it in this game. We saw it with the Clippers. Um, we saw it with the Bucks in their win. But benches – like having three guys off the bench that you can just count on matters. Um, the yeah. Knicks have it. I mean, Timberwolves have two, depending on who you ask. You know, the Clippers having Norman Powell and Mason Plumley, and they were just all their role players having a great game was huge. And then the Bucks having the same thing. So, and then Philly, like you talked about, all their bench guys struggled tonight um, from the floor. Batum played great defense as he tends to do, but still, like Heal not being able to hit a couple threes and just kind of. Um, invigorate the offense when Embiid's not on the floor. Paul Reed obviously getting, you know, minus 21, 11 minutes, all that stuff. Yeah. So let's move on to the Western Conference mm-hmm. uh, matchup between the Los Angeles Lakers and the Denver Nuggets. Before I say anything, what do you think of this game? Where are you, you are you asking in the sense, like, is this a, are you asking me, is this going to be any different than last year? Yes. Okay. 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 Um, so I think the, the, the Lakers have made a decision. They've made the decision that we are going to try to beat these guys in a shootout. We're going to try to outscore them. And I mean, that's why they run these lineups, the two guards and the three kind of bigger guys. And for that to happen, for them to do this successfully, like Delo's just got to be better. Or, or you've got to, you've got to let this go, the, the machine run through Reeves and LeBron and put on, 
Prince out there more often instead of D'Lo and put out more size. But yeah, their guards have got to be fantastic because if you look at like all the defensive breakdowns they had in the game, it was mostly because the guards are just too small. There were so many times where MPG just caught caught the ball off the catch and the late, the Lakers were doing that shift defense, you know, where you double team and then you rotate over to like the, the furthest guy and everyone kind of rotates one over. They kept doing that and like Reeves would get cross matched on MPJ and he'd yep. do a good job of like yeah. closing out on him and then MPJ would just bulldoze him or um, D'Lo would have to box out Aaron Gordon and just get beasted. So if you're going to be sacrificing that much size and having two pressure points that Denver can constantly haunt, like those guys have got to be hotter than fish grease. Um, the other thing, the other big takeaway, that little technique they tried last year with like putting Rui on Jokic, Davis is the spy is like no longer viable. And I think they realized in the fourth quarter, they put Davis on Jokic. He actually did pretty well, but Jokic just has, he's so comfortable now with it that, that he just leans up, relies on his like just 99.9th percentile in human history touch to just like finish over Rui, finish over James. It's basically got to be Davis guarding him. But um, I think, I think the Lakers are closer than they were last year. But I don't think that's really meaningful at the end of the day. And I think it's I think it's a testament to the Nuggets as well, um, just like how overwhelmingly good they are. Mm. And I forget who tweeted this. It was one of our uh, good Twitter friends. I can't remember specifically. I feel bad, um, but they tweeted, um, "It's like the cherry on top that Michael Porter Jr. has become an elite little things role player." Mm. Uh, and like, yeah. That's just terrifying. Like, that's not fair. That's not fair. This dude was supposed to just be like absolute flamethrower from three, bad at defense, doesn't pass the ball. He catches the ball. He's going to shoot it. And now it's like, oh, he's a he's a decent defender. Um, he actually does good, a good job driving and attacking closeouts. Um, he obviously can shoot off the catch. Uh, he can make the right pass, you know, simple one pass away, kind of draws a help, help defender after attacking closeout. He can make the right read. It's like, wow, that's a cheat code, um, for how phenomenally constructed this team Mm. already is. You know, what's insane about this team, you know, who their best player was in the third quarter. Who's that? KCP. We haven't even said a word about KCP yet. He just like was like, you know, you kind of forget he's there in the first half. He's he's just so like solid at everything and such a fundamentally like sound defender. You kind of forget about it sometimes. And then in the third quarter, he's like, yeah, let me like break up every ball screen. Let me intercept passes. Let me hit every movement three point shot I get. Um, And he just like he was awesome in the third quarter. And he's kind of the big reason they were able to break away. So, I mean, yeah, they're just they're tough out, man. They're it's hard like it's hard to see any team beating this team in seven i like that's my biggest takeaway as long as those five are healthy i i don't know how you would do it yeah and the fact that deandre jordan looked like an impactful player when he was out there i was like ooh, let's let's chalk this up and and go to bed um because mm-hmm. that's just they're so well coached and this is just a series that like, yeah, the talent discrepancy maybe isn't, I I think the virtue of just having Jokic alone is a major talent discrepancy. Mm -hmm. Um, But like, you know, in theory, you could make the argument that the Lakers have good enough top end talent, but I think the coaching moves the needle so much, all the like little things that the nuggets do top to bottom with guys like Peyton Watson, Christian Brown, Reggie Jackson, uh, and now Deandre Jordan, apparently, um it's Justin like holiday yeah justin holiday it's like well you know you tried we'll we'll see what happens what? the rest of the series i agree that the lakers are closer than they were last mm-hmm. year but just it's the nuggets man it's the nuggets uh, i was gonna say like you know how they say you can't coach feel like you can't like like if a player doesn't have it they kind of just don't have it and they gotta deal with it the rest of their career I swear to God, the Nuggets taught MPJ feel like his mm-hmm. rotations on defense these days. Like those are all feel reads. That's not I, like, you know what I mean? Like it's all read and react. Like he was not that kind of player. It, it's crazy. This team is just, they blow my mind. Um, the Lakers are going to need to, they're going to need to shoot him out. 
I don't know if you can beat him in a shootout four out of I don't know if you could beat Jokic Murray in a shootout four out of six games. Yeah, Murray didn't even I mean, from three, he shot four and nine on the night. Mm-hmm. Um, but like he kind of had an off night by his standards mm-hmm. overall, he shot nine of 24 from the field. Um, that's not probably, probably, I mean, anything can happen. That's probably not going to play out over the course of an entire series. He's probably mm-hmm. going to end up being a lot better than he was in game one. Um, and that's the problem with the nuggets. Like one guy has an off night. It doesn't matter. You have Michael Porter jr. Uh, who's, who's going to do something ridiculous. You've got Contavious Caldwell Pope. Who's going to go four or 10 from three. Uh, and play elite defense you've got Peyton Watson who's going to knock down his threes and be productive in his minutes and uh, play a solid role on defense Um, it's just it's not fair Um, we'll see though I mean anything can happen the Lakers might Mm -hmm. find that uh, they might finally exploit that one Jamal Murray quirk (laughs) Uh, if you know you know Um, let's move on to the Sunday games uh Celtics versus Heat. Yeah, let's just keep um, going, man. Yeah. It's, it's too it's yeah. it's too painful at this point. Yeah, no Jimmy Butler. The Celtics are unstoppable from three. They shot 45%. Um yeah. There's not a whole lot to say. Um we'll see what happens. You know, anything's possible. But Mavs Clippers. So I admittedly was not I, I had this game on, but I was not able to uh invest a ton of time into watching it um super dedicatedly unfortunately uh what are your thoughts on this one matt yeah i i mean i'm on the i haven't been able to write or podcast about it but i'm i'm pretty low i've been pretty low on the the mavericks heading into this postseason um i just don't i don't the role players are all very flawed to me and in the postseason flawed role players it's not usually a good thing. It's like something the Bucks have struggled with in the past, like these Pat Connington type one way players, Bobby Portis and the like. But um, and I thought it showed. I there's one one stat that really dawned on me. Obviously, I know everyone wants to talk about the shooting variants and stuff. And yeah, the Clippers hit some shots they probably shouldn't have. The Mavericks probably missed some shots they shouldn't have. But you also have to factor in the no Kawhi element of it. But um, one stat that really dawned on me: Kyrie and Doncic combined for 64 points the rest of the team at 33. Whereas Paul George and James Harden combined for 50 points and the rest of the team at 59. And I just, the thing that that really worries me about this Dallas team is their role players. Um, You like in that game, the Clippers have Terrence Mann, who's basically doing his best impersonation of Josh Hart in this game. Um, You have Norman Powell, who's like a human flamethrower. You have, I think the guy who's like the keystone to everything for this Clippers team in the series, Ivica Zubac, just he's such a bad matchup for Gafford and for Kleba, Kleba and for um and for Lively, just because he's so big, he's so big, and the the thing is, and you've talked about this in the past, um, I think in video form for sure, in podcast form, but just his ability to finish with both hands, he's such a skilled finisher, left hook, right hook, like it's. It's so tough to defend great him. Just the, yeah. yeah, great touch, phenomenal touch, great offensive rebounder, super physical. Um, I don't know, dude. I think even if Kawhi misses like another game or two in the series, I still really like the Clippers. Even with the variance element, I just don't trust J- Dallas's role players at all. Yeah, uh, there's. I think I'm starting to realize that um, – the flaws that the Mavericks have, and I've obviously been very high on the Mavericks, mm. and I'm, I may end up eating my words from the regular season about how high I was on them. Um, granted, you know, the Clippers are the Clippers. They, Despite their ending to the season, this was still a good, very, very good team throughout the entire season. So it's not like it's not like this would be the Mavericks being upset by like the eighth seed or like the ninth seed that snuck into the plan. It's like, no, this is the Clippers who were in – contention for a top four seed literally all season um besides like the first you know month um but the mavericks have weaknesses that during the regular season on a game-to-game basis coaches probably aren't going to be sitting there looking super hard at like okay we need to exploit this specific thing about the mavericks in this random regular season matchup in march but now in a playoff setting against a coach like Ty Lue, 
it's like, no, he's going to find your biggest insecurity as a team and absolutely hammer it into oblivion. And that's something that separates kind of mediocre coaching from elite coaching is some of the more mediocre coaches will do something really right. And then they just stop doing it. The Clippers with Ty Lue, they're not going to do that. They're going to hammer something until it stops working because you finally adjusted and figured it out. And then when that point comes, they're going to find something else to beat you with. Um, And the Mavericks, not only I think have a coaching disadvantage just with Jason Kidd, I don't think he's as, I think he's, a better coach than he generally gets credit for, but I don't think he's a, nearly as good of a coach as Ty Lue. Um, and then also it's a lot harder to cover for um, some of their weaknesses. Cause like you said, they all have, they're all very flawed role players outside of the Luca and the Kyrie um, of it all. So I'll say this. Um, it's funny saying this cause he had 33, 13, 12, no 33, 13 and six, but I'm sure when you watch this, Doncic was just, not himself. He had off game. He missed a couple shots. He usually hits. There was a couple passes that he shouldn't have made that he usually doesn't make. Um, just a weird. So he didn't play his a game. Like it's. I don't think that every game will look like this. I think they'll. I think the Mavericks are going to win some games in the series. I think there'll be a lot of competitive games in the series. But I don't know, just like it's hard, man. Like Derek Jones Jr. has like he kills your offense right without with his his spacing. PJ Washington. I think he's he's shown me that he's a very good defender. He's a big body, plays physical, great close out attacker, but he also is not a good shooter. He's not a reliable shooter. Josh Green is reckless. He plays like Crash Bandicoot. Um, Tim Hardaway Jr. is a you know he's like paper on defense. Even though he's got great biceps, I didn't realize it till yesterday. Um, guy's got phenomenal biceps. Um, Dante Exum still don't trust him as a shooter. He only took like a hundred threes this year. He shoots a slow ass shot. Am I missing a Gafford and Lively are both susceptible to like strength. Kleber is not as switchable as people think he is in theory. You know, like there's all these like flaws. So I don't know. I think it's tough to win like that. Yeah, I, we can put a button in the in the Mavs Clippers for we'll now. Talk we'll, more see, about them. we'll we'll see what happens in game two because um, you know any. I've said it throughout the entire episode so far. Anything can happen over the course of a series. Uh, Seldom is a series one in game one. Uh, oftentimes you see things play out uh, usually a lot differently as, as adjustments are made and teams watch film. That's the big thing to be thinking about is like all of these things that we're talking about, all these different weaknesses for all these teams, just know whatever we're pointing out, all these teams have, you know, interns and film guys and coaching staff and scouting departments sitting in, a room watching this film, breaking it down like step by step, dribble by dribble for hours and hours on end in between these games. So, uh, you know, you push the right buttons, things can change fast, but let's move on to the bucks versus the Pacers. This game did not go how I thought it was going to go at all. Uh, Hmm. no Giannis and the Milwaukee bucks blew the Pacers out of the water uh the the bucks shot well from three but not like an oh it wasn't like a shooting variance game by any means like not even close mm-hmm. to it they shot 37.8 percent from three 14 of 37 um the pacers on the other hand you talk about shooting variance and they were on the uh butt end of shooting variance the indiana pacers who we have talked all season about their absolutely electric offense uh, that just punishes you and goes on ridiculous runs uh, due to their insane three-point shooting. Shot eight of 38 from three, 21%. Very uncharacteristic of them. Matt, how are you feeling about this after watching this game? Um, I think the star of the show is Chris Middleton. I know Dame had 35 in the first half. Um, I was kind of unmoved by it a little bit just because a lot of it was his step backs and all that stuff. And that's pretty volatile shooting. I thought Nemhart actually did a solid job guarding him, to be honest. Um, I I think he got cooked unnecessarily, but um, yeah, Middleton looks, he looks great, dude. He looks the best I've seen him look in like three years, both sides of the ball. Defensively, he was using his strength. He had a couple good low man rotations, couple good closeouts. And then offensively, um, there was a couple possessions guys just move. He's like, he's like, um, 
jockeying for position, using like his body to like move people and stuff, like kind of like Reggie Miller. And he's getting these, you know, off, um, get into his spots, the reposts, all that crazy stuff. He looked, he looked so good. And I think that changes a lot for the Bucks if they could just like rely on him on both sides of the ball to kind of be the guy he was in uh, 2021. So I thought that was huge. I think uh, Halliburton we need to talk about because I really just don't know like what went wrong. Uh, you just very like super tentative, super passive, just wasn't in himself at all. Um, I think some of that has to do with the Bucs just hitting shots, being able to reset their defense, Pacers not being able to play super fast. Um, thought Siakam looked good. I thought that the Pacers bench is going to be very problematic. I don't know who they can really trust off that bench. I know McConnell had his moments, but he's always been a kind of guy who kind of decreases, diminishes in the postseason. Jalen Smith looked awful. Doug McDermott looked awful. I think they were both like a minus 17 or something in their minutes. Yeah. Um, Obi Toppin's just, you know, who he is at this point. Ben Shepard's still too young. I don't know where they're like who their guy is off the bench. And it lets since they don't like since they don't want to have anybody on their bench really, like the Bucs can get away with just going by Portis to five bench lineups, like offensively slanted lineups. By Portis had a great game. Yeah, he looked uh, to great. his credit. Yeah, this is a matchup thought, that he was made for, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, you know these kind of like flawed teams, like like flawed playoff level teams. This is Bobby's gonna feast. Uh, I will say I liked just from a tactical perspective. I liked the decision to put Lopez on Siakam and Portis on Turner. I thought that was a smart move, paid dividends for them early on. But overarching, I'll say it definitely changes my perception of these two teams for this series. It doesn't change my like overarching potential for either of them as a postseason team. I think that's entirely fair. Um, mm. it, it is interesting. I, I, I'm more interested to see how this year. This was not like a must win. Game one is, mm. I mean, you can say on paper it's a must win. Any game in the playoffs is a must win game. But no Giannis, this was kind of a must win game in the sense Mm -hmm. that like okay they're without their best player we really hope that like we can capitalize on this steal one on the road get the series started off right i don't know if Giannis will be back for game two or not um if he's not i mean the pacers really got to win that because you know stealing one on the road uh, the, the the saying has always been a series doesn't start till uh, team steals one on the road and um, the Pacers are definitely in that position where they need to get the series started in these non Giannis games I have a feeling he'll probably be back for game two just uh, based on vibes like my gut tells me he'll he'll probably be back for game I think two, they bought but... him a game yeah I think the Bucks winning that game bought him a game I think he'll he'll be out game two to be honest yeah if I if I'm the Bucks, I mean no pressure to bring him back I, mm. We saw it with the Hawks too in the 2021 Eastern Conference Finals. It was like, why would we bring them back? Like, we're still winning. Middleton's mm. dropping 40 point games. Middleton didn't even have like like he had a he had a great game. He still had an off shooting night from three. Mm. And he, I agree with you that he looked the best he's looked in years. Just healthy, moving really well. The shot looked good. He was getting to his spots without issue. Um, he was getting into rhythm, which negated a lot of the defense that was being played against him. Um, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens, but, but game one made me feel a lot better about the bucks than I did coming into the series. Can I say this as well? Like Neesmith, he looked very comfortable against Neesmith and that's concerning, particularly when Giannis comes back because Giannis, like right now they could probably get away with moving Neesmith onto Portis and having Siakam guard Middleton, who I think Siakam did a better job just with his length, size, all that stuff. But there's like no shot that they could do that when Giannis is back. Like Siakam needs to be on Giannis and they're already gonna have to overload on Giannis and all that stuff. And so the fact that Middleton's already this comfortable with one of their best perimeter defenders on him is is a little bit worrisome for the Pacers. Yeah. Let's uh let's Let's put a before pin we, in that. Before we go to oh, yeah. before we pin in, just really quickly, I want to know what you thought of Halliburton's performance. I I think it's as simple. There are people who who cover the Pacers, obviously, that 
um, will we'll probably be a lot more granular than this, um, and understandably so because there's so much minutia to unpack in basketball. Um, but yeah, he's simply got to be aggressive. And mm -hmm. if he is not imposing himself as a scoring threat, you don't get the advantages of his playmaking that you would otherwise get. Another thing that's really obvious to me is Buddy Heald. We know him as like Buddy Heald, the three-point shooter, one of the greatest three-point shooters ever. But what he did for the Pacers, aside from just his three-point shooting, was his driving. Buddy Heald was very good at getting the ball, and he's always going to demand a closeout 100% of the time. And he was really good at driving, and I think that really helped the Pacers' offense a lot. And I think that's why we saw when they traded him, they kind of took a dip a little bit um, and, and kind of had to readjust. Um, the lack of Buddy Heald makes the need for Tyrese Halliburton's scoring a lot bigger. Um, and if he's not, you know, driving or trying to um, draw extra help in the mid range, force that, that nail help, force digs, if he's not doing that, you make the Bucks' life really easy on defense. Really easy. Mm -hmm. Did you notice yeah. they didn't – I mean, th this is also the Bucks, but you notice they didn't really send too many doubles his way, kind of just trying to play these actions flat? Yeah. Yeah, that was – that was concerning mm -hmm. uh, for the Pacers. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll say before before we move on to the last series – I mean, one thing, though, that shouldn't surprise people, I feel like Halliburton's game has always been, like, he capitalizes on, like, what the defense gives him, right? And he's not, like, a he doesn't dictate as much as, like, some other stars. And so when the defense is, like, kind of daring him to dictate, it, it can lead to these precarious situations. Yeah, well said. Um, mm. Last series, probably... I'm a little biased. This might be the best game of the playoffs so far. Um, Pelicans versus Thunder. What a game. Um, if you like old school basketball, low scoring games, this game was for you. If you like tough shot making and uh, huge shifts in momentum from start to finish, this game was for you. This game had it all. It was, it was a great, great, great game. Um, I thought tactically the Pelicans game plan worked very well. That being said, I think the other thing we also realized was there is only so much you can do and OKC's offense is just good enough that like really good defensive scheme will only get you so far at a certain point, you have to counteract it with your offense being good enough to put points on them. Cause like your defense will get you, you can have the Pelicans were great defensively. I mean, the shots that they left open paid off. They didn't, the OKC did not knock down those shots. Um, and overall, I just thought they, they were very, very disciplined and did not like, waste a ton of opportunities defensively and make a ton of mistakes. Um, but offensively is where I'm kind of like, they missed their mark a little bit. They did not knock down the threes that they probably needed to. Um, Trey Murphy, shout out to him. He was five of 12 on the night, 21 points. He looked spectacular. Um, Brandon Ingram. I'm a little concerned about. Mm -hmm. Lou Dort did a phenomenal job on Brandon Ingram and Brandon Ingram. We know he's a tough shot maker and sometimes the better defense you play against Brandon Ingram, the more likely he is to make shots. Um, that being said, it still looked like he was uh, rattled by Dort. Um, I talked about this with um, our good buddy, Tim, uh, he covers the Pelicans. Uh, he does a great job. Fantastic work. Um, I was watching the game in discord with him last night and, uh, he was talking about Brandon Ingram, how he's 
a great driver. Like Brandon Ingram shot 72% at the rim this year. He's a great driver. He can finish at the rim and like you can have a ton of benefits as an offense. If you run your offense through Brandon Ingram as a driver and he also allow him to do his thing in the mid range and kind of be this pseudo heliocentric kind of guy. Um, yet he shot five of 17 from the field. And I felt like a lot of it was because he just was hunting those mid range looks. And it's not to say Brandon Ingram can't knock them down. He can, but that's not what you want to like build the foundation on which you want to build your offense on. Um, I thought the driving overall for the Pelicans was very lackluster. CJ McCollum, uh, had a lot of great moments in this game and, even still, I was a little underwhelmed with his performance just because he's – you kind of have to be able to break this defense, this OKC defense, like just get through them and force them into rotation um, because like a lot of the times their digs are just so powerful and they have the the defenders to guard you one-on-one to where like you're just going to be disrupted. You're not going to get through that first line and – I felt like the Pelicans for as, as good as they played uh, at times in the runs that they went on, I felt like they had a hard time breaking OKC's defense and forcing them to get uncomfortable and get into rotation. Um, So all of that being said, it came down to one possession. It was a one possession game. Mm -hmm. I mean, CJ McCollum as good of defense as Cason Wallace played against him. CJ McCollum, kind of got a good look i mean he was open on his shot he just missed it it was definitely an off balance shot case and forced him into a difficult shot but he was open as open as you could be in that situation um and you know the shot just didn't fall ultimately one of my biggest takeaways okc did not shoot well from three and okc is a very good three-point shooting team Mm -hmm. OKC not only they they did not not shoot well from three because the Pelicans were just like contesting super hard and and disrupting every single shot OKC shot poorly from three on like wide open threes I don't expect that to play out over the course of an entire series so all I'll say is I'm, I'm interested to see how New Orleans looks to counteract that going forward if the shots start falling and i say if with an asterisk because this feels very much like a variance thing where it will level out over the course of seven games if it goes to that so this is the this one in the heat series are the the games i haven't watched yet i'm actually i'm going to watch it after we're done recording this i won't be watching the heat game um for the record but uh so I have questions for you. I don't have any takes, just questions. Okay. Um, so I can kind of I go might have first answer. question. First question, how did you feel about Shay in his playoff debut? How did he do? His playoff debut as a superstar. You know, I the weaknesses that we've discussed of his throughout the season, mm-hmm. I'm like a lot more I think the 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 question that it ultimately came down to is okay Shea is flawed he's amazing but Shea is flawed Mm -hmm. how much can OKC handle Shea's flaws being pinpointed and exploited and I think the answer to me is they could do a pretty dang good job of of Mm -hmm. handling it when Shea is being game planned so heavily against um and that being said I mean he still did what he needed to do. He didn't make a three. He only shot three of them, which is about on par with the season average, I believe, um, Mm -hmm. as far as volume. He still made 11 shots on the night. They were all pretty difficult buckets. He was still carving the defense apart and getting to the rim when he needed to. Dropped 28 points. um, And then I just, he got to the line. He is more... Maybe we'll see against a better defense. And I mean, I can't I, I can't even say that because the Pelicans were a great defensive team this year. It's like 
how much better of a defense are they realistically going to run into in the Western Conference outside of the Timberwolves, which is still a, obviously a possibility. Mm-hmm. Um, Shea is more, seems to be, obviously this is one game, Shea seems to be a bit more playoff proof than I anticipated just by virtue of tough shot making um, and like the the rest of the team being so good that like, oh crap, we're really too honed in on Shea, but now the other guys are beating us. That's kind of an issue. Um, and I, I, I'm saying that like the other guys on OKC did such a great job you know, Jalen Williams, 19 points, 44% from the field, 20% from three. Um, Chet Holmgren, six of 14 from the field, two of six from three. It's like the other guys really didn't even play that well. And Shea was still able to go on the runs when they needed it. it like that third quarter rolled around and it was like, oh, third quarter OKC is here and they're going to do their thing. Fourth quarter, he just keeps making tough shots. I don't know. I just I don't have as many concerns anymore, really. Mm-hmm. We'll see over the course of an entire series, but the fact that Shea had like more of a mediocre game by his standards and the rest of the guys had mediocre games, quote unquote. I I don't know. This just this was a mediocre version of OKC and they won. It was a one possession game. It could it was a coin toss, but um, the fact that they had a bad game and it still came down to a 50 50 ball, I feel pretty good about OKC. This isn't as bad of a matchup mm. as I think I maybe thought like a month ago. Okay. Okay. Well, one thing I should have thought to say when you mentioned the variance thing um, that it'll eventually even out. It probably won't though against the Pelicans, dude, because they have like they have the dark magic special right. um opponent three point shooting. That's but true. um the other big question I had for you is how how big of a deal was like Valanchunas' physicality? How do you think they handled it? I so my whole thing was I don't think the Pelicans leveraged it enough. Mm-hmm. I felt as though they went away from it when they didn't really need to. He only took nine shots throughout the entire game. Um, the first half, he shot three of three. Second half, he shot two of six. Um, I think Chet did a better job of making him uncomfortable. Um, I thought OKC was better about... I think they started to send more defenders at him when he would get the ball in the post, and they were quicker to kind of send that post double and uh, rotate out of that. And I thought that worked really well. Um, because I mean, you, in theory, you send those double teams at him, he's going to make the right passes. There's going to be someone open, um, somewhere on the floor. OKC is going to end up getting rotation in the rotation eventually, but Valanciunas only had one assist on, or, uh, one assist on the night. Um, I think OKC was smart about where they sent the doubles from. So it wasn't just an easy one pass away. Uh, and those double teams also disrupted the flow of his shot. Um, in a lot of the shots that he made, uh, of the ones that he took, Chet still did a good job defending them. I thought they were not like physicality. I'm backing you down, punishing you and throwing it down two mm. hands at the rim. They were like, no, I'm having to take like a turnaround hook shot on the baseline over you. Like that's still a tough shot, even with guys who have great touch, uh, Valanciunas hit him, but like as a defense, you probably live with those shots. Yeah. Last question before we get out of here. Is there any clarity on the uh, fifth guy question after this game? For OKC? Mm -hmm. I think you have options, actually. (laughs) Um, Yeah. (laughs) It's like the prettiest girl in high school. They went like (laughs) 10 deep, 11 deep, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I think... Cason Wallace probably he didn't take a single shot um or no I still have it set to he, I was going to say he definitely shot more than that. Um he made two he made one of his two threes that he took but the defense was elite. I mean he played mm-hmm. phenomenal defense. Um he might be the fifth guy. Okay. He might be the fifth. Interesting. Guy. 
Um, other than that, I would say Aaron Wiggins might deserve a look as well. But uh, he should yeah. be the first guy. Right. First option, Aaron yeah. Wiggins. <laughs> Uh, but that's going to wrap it up for this episode of the media pass. Uh, thank you all for listening. I'm so excited. This was so much fun. I'm so glad the playoffs are back. Uh, mm-hmm. we are going to have an episode coming out, doing the same thing for the rest of the playoffs every week, uh, until, t- until it's over. And then, uh, you know, we'll cross the off season bridge when it comes, but thank you guys so much for listening. Be sure to subscribe, leave a like, follow five star rating, wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to leave a question. If you have any, we'll answer them on the next episode. Uh, be sure to follow us on Twitter at Alex Hoops underscore at Matt Issa 15 M A T I S S A one five. We'll see you guys in the next one.